Welcome to Human Everywhere. This podcast is focused on the future of the human being in deep space exploration. As humanity looks towards the stars and there are commercial efforts, and we begin to move from just the casual approach to space exploration to one that is full of intent where we live amongst the stars. The challenge before us is how do we remember that we are human and what does it mean to be human in space? I am one of your hosts, Jason Bott. We are also a part of Deep Space Predictive, and with me is Ubi. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, I think we could probably say this is the official start maybe to season two. We, we're kind of kind of got two things. So yes, Adam, it's your, your season two, episode one, as they, as they say in the Netflix world. Um, so welcome, uh, Adam. First of all, it's great to see you again. So we Quick, uh, quick recap. We met Adam Diapert at uh, IAC, which is the International Astronautics Congress that was in Paris this year. Um, and we we had this amazing. I felt it was like two hours. I mean, it felt like uh, all like just a week's worth of information. But we sat and had this really incredible conversation, and we wanted to share some of that with all of you because. It's really a, a, a fascinating and super interesting way to think about as we get closer and closer to going into space, uh, what does that mean for, for us, for humans, for our bodies even? Um, so Adam, hello, how are you? And tell, tell everybody, I, I always like to have you kind of introduce you, yourself as you would introduce to somebody because I never do it justice. So Welcome, first of all, how are you? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I appreciate uh, having this chance to talk with you more. Um, I am a circus performer. I've been doing that professionally for 20 years, uh, and I'm also a physicist. I work at North Carolina State University, and I study um, some properties of the neutron, um, and it's to uncover deep secrets about the universe. Um, so... Yeah, those two things are pretty much uh, the core of my identity, uh, uh, circus and science. And in the last seven years, I have um, started to become really obsessed with movement in altered gravitational environments. And so I've been on a number of parabolic flights, and I've been on a bunch of, um, or into a bunch of analog environments, which facilitate movement in unique ways that are different than the type of movement that we experience on the surface of the Earth. And so uh, my research has been studying what does it mean to become a competent mover in altered gravitational environments. And as I've been studying that, um, the cognitive consequences of needing to learn new movement techniques and how um, sense sensory experiences and movement experiences influence uh, the type of thinking that we do and the type mm. of thinking that's necessary for us to uh, communicate both through movement and through language, um, especially once we, yeah. we get to uh, regular living in altered gravitational environments. Yeah, I mean, it's just so fascinating. So what we're going to do, I'm going to share a video um, that really just inspired me when we first started talking, um, and Jason as well. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. So, so here's Adam kind of demonstrating this idea of juggling in zero gravity, right? Uh, Adam, I'll let you talk through it. Yeah, so what you're seeing here, uh, this is an analog environment, and the balls that I'm throwing are moving in straight lines. And um, you can see the stars in the background are spinning in a circle. So what I'm doing is spinning the camera with, um, with me as I'm spinning. So you see the stars are stationary there, and then they start rotating, which lets you know that the camera is rotating. And um, so I'm throwing the balls, and even though they're moving in straight lines, um, because the camera is rotating, they look like they're moving in curves. And so um, I wanted to explore... Um, you know, what would it be like to juggle in weightlessness? And as I started doing that, um, this idea about rotating the camera with my body, because, you know, that's the first question is how do you juggle in weightlessness and make it interesting? Um, so that's where the spinning the body first started. Um, and then, and then after I started 
experimenting with it um, and I was watching it, I just kind of wondered like, what would happen if I rotated the camera with me? So I rotated the camera and, um, and it, it was, you know, on this topic that you were mentioning before, Jason, about like, you know, what happens when we're actually in that environment. So when I first started it, you know, I'm throwing those balls and they're moving in straight lines and you do have to go to the website or to the YouTube page to kind of like see the straight lines a number of times to, you know, accept that aspect of it. But um, the balls move in straight lines. And when I first started doing it and I was spinning in a circle, I was trying to think about the balls moving in straight lines. And I never had motion sickness um, throughout my life. I grew up in Florida where there's a lot of boats and stuff. And so I think I was on boats a lot. And that's, you know, that um, helps people adapt um, to extreme, um, you know, vestibular uh, experiences. And, and so uh, I'm spinning, I'm throwing the balls and I started getting headaches like very regularly. And I'm trying to think about them moving in straight lines. And then when I um, started recording the video and then I started rotating the video so that I could see actually what I was seeing, that's when I saw the curves for real for the first time. And even though previous to that, I had been trying to plan so that I would throw and catch along straight lines. Once I accepted the reality of the curves, it huh. transformed my entire experience <laughs> and uh, the headaches went away. And I started uh, planning movements in a, um, in a reference frame that was the one that I was experiencing. But because I was stuck, it, previous to that and thinking that like, oh, I know they're going in straight lines. So of course I have to think about them as going in straight lines. You know, that just wasn't useful for me. And um, and so um, I feel like it was a really clear transition in my own experience because uh, I'd done like a lot of movement uh, training for altered gravitational environments prior to this. This was the deepest one. This one I, I, I did very regularly for about 18 months, like at least every week, sometimes uh, five times a week. And um, mm. it, yeah, it really opened my eyes uh, to what's, um, what value can be brought by accepting the experiences that we're actually having. And that is a lesson that, of course, I hope we all will learn someday if we haven't already <laughs> learned that, ex that, you know, but um, also to consider, you know, how people are going to be living in the future when, you know, um, non-professional astronauts are living in space, uh, you know, what, it, what insights are they going to bring? And are we going to be capable of accepting the realities that they are offering to us? Because uh, in my experience, like I didn't accept the reality of those balls moving in curves and, you know, if you can't accept a physical reality um, that, you know, is objective, <laughs> then, um, <laughs> then, you know, like how hard is it going to be for us to object, uh, accept the subjective experiences that people are going to be having or the subjective experiences that people are presently having? So let, maybe let's start with kind of the obstacles that get in the way of us accepting those realities so what what is it that is going to keep us from from being able to do that oh, man. I, I mean it's it, yeah anyway i'll just throw that out there and see what happens <laughs> you just go straight for the hardball don't you <laughs> wow yes. that's a, that's a really good question what is in the way um that is what you asked right What's yes in, yeah exactly yeah, yeah well I think that we haven't quite given enough credit to the manner in which gravity has influenced um, the type of thinking and planning and reasoning and uh, maybe even the type of morality that we have. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about uh, kind of like the, the, the lowest level um, form of justice, would be like equality, right? Or fairness would be equality. Uh, if you take that all the way to its root, it becomes an eye for an eye, right? And mm -hmm. of course, we don't want to think about that now because we, we believe we've evolved a little bit beyond an eye for an eye. Um, right. I think that's debatable whether or not we actually have evolved out of that yet. <laughs> but, right. um, but, you know, that concept comes from the Code of Hammurabi, right? Which is the like ancient mm -hmm. Sumerian um, 
code of conduct. And, um, and so, so, you know, it's like rooted deeply in the, the cognition patterns of, of humanity, especially people mm -hmm. in the West. And um, shortly after that, like, I think it was around uh, the 2000 BC time is when we first found a, a hieroglyph showing um, those scales that you can like balance things, you know, on mm -hmm. each side of the scale. And people would use those, you know, you weigh grain and you weigh rocks or whatever, and, and you figure out what fair is in a trade by, by weighing things, right? And at that same time, the first time it popped up, it also mm -hmm. was used uh, in the way that we were kind of more familiar with it in Egyptian mythology, where your heart was weighed against the feather to determine if you were pure enough to go into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Right. So it immediately transitioned from being a physical object into being a spiritual object, having subjective meaning on our mm -hmm. decision-making processes and what we perceived to be reasonable mm -hmm. and the manner in which we did morality. And that same object, that scales, went into Greece, right? They used the scales, uh, it went to Rome. And then now it's used as, you know, in the United States, it's used in our, our, our justice, you know, physical representation. And it's in all over the yeah. world, there's a bunch of countries doing this. And so um, that object actually only works in a gravitational field. And so, you know, I think that the argument <laughs> is, is, you know, I'm not saying this is absolutely solid, I haven't done every level of it, but that's a yeah. clear step-by-step -step demonstration of how gravity has a direct impact on the way you perceive justice yeah and wow. I think it's worth it for us to consider like where are the other ways that this has happened and mm -hmm. i'm not saying we need to get rid of all of them but i think we're going to learn a lot when people are living in other places and it would be nice to at least to start catalog cataloging where are our gravitational biases and what uh, things are we not expecting them to be influencing? No, I, I think you've hit on something. You know, my background is obviously mythology, so I start moving to that mm -hmm. um, and start quickly thinking about the fact that you're actually hinting upon the origin of a lot of the archetypal um, psychology that we have. These things that, you know, just even the constant idea of the underworld, um, uh. constant you know, vertical up and down motion that we have that, you know, whatever is worthwhile, whatever is valuable is above, whatever is to be denounced is to be below. And again, that's not universal. You know, the, the, the Celts, the Gaelics had an under uh, understanding that the afterlife was actually below their feet, but there were cultures that ascended past that, but across the board for the majority of human history, we tend to think of things in that vertical standpoint with gravity truly defining that, um, you know, binary nature of what is good and wrong um, and how we orient ourselves. I, I think that was one of the key things I think really grabbed me about what you were talking about was it is an orientation um, or a reorientation of motion, of rotation. Um, that it's not just operating when, even when we think about going from here up to there, we automatically think about, oh, we're going from gravity to zero gravity. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference, but you're thinking about a whole lot more. And I wonder what this is going to do to our understanding of what it means to be human. We talk about human everywhere, but we also recognize that human everywhere means that the leap into space, the crossing of that threshold is going to force a redefinition of what it means to be human. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I think about um, what I hope we're going to find is that um, the things that are constant throughout this process of transition are the things that we will eventually perceive to be human. Um, I huh. kind of longer term uh, hope that we eventually are capable of perceiving other beings as being, you know, what we would identify with as as human as well, whether or not we keep using that word, but, um, you know, kind of short term, just thinking about, um, yeah, we have a pretty long history of not perceiving people who we disagree with uh, to be actual humans, especially mm -hmm. in the United States. And uh, that history um, did, did not start getting officially recognized 
uh, rectified until uh, very recently. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. So can't consider ourselves to evolved just yet. <laughs> right. Well, and and the the that 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 definition of what human is and in this orientation that that Jason that you're talking about, like it, it's like if we break that down, um, it. it it starts with, I guess, first of all, like how we orient ourselves here on earth. And you were talking a little bit about that, Adam, like what, what does it mean for us to orient ourselves physically here on earth? Yeah. Um, you know, it starts from when you're a kid, right. And, um, as Jason was mentioning, it's in relationship to gravity and a hugely important, experience for children is when they're able to put their hands down and, you know, push and pull with their back so that they can lift their own heads up and start to look around, right? right? So like from the very right. beginning, you're already in relationship with the whole planet in this, mm -hmm. in this way. And, um, and so uh, one of my favorite questions uh, is like, just in your head right now, close your eyes real quick. Okay. Just honestly, close your eyes and okay. imagine a human. Okay. Now, uh, okay, you can you can let go of your your human figure now and open your eyes. That was that was the, that was a whole exercise. Now we can just and I hope everybody at home did that as well. You can just analyze like what imagery did you have, right? Like was yeah. your a lot of people might have a human looking down or a human standing up or a human sitting in a chair or whatever, right? And if and if they're in that position, then like your expectation about what a human is is in relationship to gravity, and um and you know that's a pretty powerful <laughs> thing mm. to recognize. Um, yeah. If you study and you know look at, well, okay. So if you think about what happens when astronauts are sleeping, um, if you look at pictures from um, especially the space shuttle, because they're all kind of sleeping in the same room often in that case, um, their arms will kind of like drift up, you know, so they'll kind of be at this angled position. Yeah. It will drift up, and what happens is that like all of your limbs go into an intermediate position, right? You're not in extension which is where everything's pulled back and you're not in flexion where everything's pulled in and i would argue like that's the actual shape of a human you know is in this relaxed position where you're not extended and you're not contracted um and the um funny thing about that is that it shows us a bit about how the environment shapes what we what we are right and that like our sensory motor experiences in the environment um have a profound impact on how we how we plan obviously like mm -hmm. when you're getting to the other side of the room you have to plan walking around stuff you don't just jump to the ceiling and then you know <laughs> jump to <jump, jump, laughs> right. or whatever um, yeah but then you know I, this week it's really been hitting me um I'm in New Mexico where the sky is just huge you know and there's there's lots lots of stars to see all the time and yeah. um and I was just thinking about how like no matter where you are on the northern hemisphere those stars and those constellations show you that you're on earth right mm -hmm. and the um you you know you could be here you could be in china you could be in norway like whatever you're going to see the same stars and mm -hmm. so even though they seem like other because they're over there they actually are the thing reflecting to us that we are all here and um hmm. in that same way gravity is also reflecting to us about where we are and what we're doing and so um you know just the like structure of how we communicate where we are how we communicate what to do in order to perform an action or to get to another place or something um mm -hmm. those are all embedded in this this um relationship to gravity and once we start moving out of that and being capable of expressing um ways to move that don't respond to gravity that ways to move that are oriented only from our within ourselves um you know maybe you're like interacting with the surface but maybe you're not you know in weightlessness mm -hmm. you don't have to be interacting with the surface and we don't even have language to express that yet uh in in an articulate way because we've never needed it right like why yeah. why would we have have <laughs> brought that up and what's so wild is that in some ways the weightless experience it facilitates the first um embodiment of what we in the west um idealize a lot which is individualism right mm -hmm. um, because there's no way on the surface of the earth that you get to act from yourself 
you're always acting in relationship to everything around you. You can't do anything without pushing off of the chair that you're sitting in, pushing off the ground that you're walking on, pushing against the water that you're swimming in, whatever. Um, and this has been one of the most profound transformations in my life of my hmm. self-perception is that um, now when I get into a tough situation, I just think like, okay, man, I have done my self-rotation techniques. Like I know how to be myself and I know how to move my body so that I can get into the orientation that is the one that I want. And so if like things aren't going wrong or, or aren't going right, almost always the problem is my perception of the situation. <laughs> you know, very rarely is it not yeah. my perception that is messing up the, the thing. And so um, visualizing myself as a person in weightlessness where I control my own orientation and I've done my moves and I know how, how to practice in order to get there um, has really freed me in a lot of situations from feeling the burden that um, other people or other situations are causing my problems. Um, you know, there are very few times that the problems are not caused by my own internal reflection <laughs> to the problem, you know, or, Isn't or to fascinating, the right? Yeah, for sure. Well, and man, and so, you know, there's this, you mentioned this concept of center of mass when we first talked and, and th this, the, the physical, so, so when, when you go up into, to zero gravity, your body almost has to do a re reset, right? Like the, the, the physical aspects that orient us to our environment sort of they don't have anything to orient to right and so they kind of shut down and so everything you're talking about is while it, it seems you know psychological philosophical it, it really does have to also be physical right like what does that what does that mean yeah so um we have a thing called proprioception which is a multi-sensory integration of um, our environment and our internal uh, sense organs so that uh, we can tell where we are in, in the world. <laughs> you know, like, are you right. sitting up? Um, and it, inc it includes sight and it includes sound and it includes uh, your vestibular system, which is the thing in your inner ear that tells you if your head's turning or if it's going forward and backwards. And it includes um, muscle spindles, which are the things that in your muscles tell you if your muscles mm. are contracting or not. You know, we only think of the four, five senses as like the senses, but you know, there, there's a lot more senses than that. Right. And, um, and all of those like mesh into this crazy explosion of, of what you're experiencing as your consciousness and as where you are in the world right now. And so when you go into weightlessness, oh, and I guess just to say, so I've been on three parabolic flights. Uh, I've been on two mm -hmm commercial flights and one research flight. And I've done something like 57 or 58 parabolas. I keep huh. not remembering. I should know that answer for sure. Uh, anyways, <laughs> no, I've, I've spent a, not, you know, that's only like 20 minutes in weightlessness or whatever, but that's, that's what I got. That's what I can report on. <laughs> and so yeah. I, um, so, uh, my experience and talking to a couple of other movement artists, uh, okay. Another tangent. This is why we need more artists to go to space is because they can possibly have a higher skill level at articulating physical experiences mm -hmm. in language to share with other people. And that's, the story. That's, Agreed. 100% that's that's agree. My whole That's my whole argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally um, agree. Yeah. Uh, and so um, the, let's see, what was I saying? Yeah. So so when you first go there, it's like, like you can't rely on any of these things that you've experienced, right? Your vestibular system, you know, they say it doesn't have anything going on. You're not experiencing something um, mm -hmm. powerful in it, but I think that's another place where we just don't have the language to describe it yet. For example, if you don't see things, um, we don't say like, like you have no visual experience. We say it's dark. Hmm. Right. <laughs> if you can't hear things, we don't say like you, your sound is shut off. We say there, you, it's quiet, right? But that also means yeah. nothing is, you know, vibrating loud enough in order to get above the threshold of you actually hearing something, right? And it's the same with the vestibular system. They say like, oh, there's no vestibular experience. It's just that it's not above a certain threshold. And we don't have enough experience to even talk about what that experience is like. And we don't have a word for vestibular darkness, right? Mm -hmm. and so, um, so when you go into this, your vestibular system isn't getting information. Lifting your arm no longer has um, 
uh, resistance against gravity. Mm -hmm. So your spindle, you know, receptors are all messed up. Um, you, uh, you know, your when when you fall. Oh yeah. So this is another layer. All vertebrates have vestibular systems. So okay. that's how deep this this thing is, and how important it is for you to know when you're falling, because that's what it's for, right? Is that if you're going to fall, get ready. Your body yeah. responds to that, and so if you don't um, have that, then your body, your whole system starts shutting down, and your proprioception has has no input, and your body's freaking out. It thinks it's falling, and you just become like crazy tunnel vision eyeball. Hmm. And that's all it is. It's just eyeballs and, and tunnel vision. And so what you have to do is like figure out how to re-inhabit your entire body mm. piece by piece. And um, and that's kind of like the lesson of it is like, you know, mm. almost like birth, like you're just out in some place. I can't say it's almost like birth. I don't remember it, but, but you know, you're just <laughs> out in this place that is totally different. And yeah. now you have to re-figure nope. out every everything. How do you move it? How do you sense it? Um, and, and, you know, it's worth, it's worth experiencing if, if you can. What's interesting is, uh, yeah. just a quick, just to show how profound and how on the very edge, what you're talking about is a quick Google search for vestibular darkness only gives three legitimate results. Mm -hmm. That's it. No one's talking about this. Like this is very, very a new concept for us and it's part of that developing you know new images new understanding and you're right it took an artist to do it because scientists have been studying weightlessness and zero gravity for a very long time but bringing the artist's mind to it i think is what's critically different i think that's part of what human everywhere means humans are not just scientists we're not just engineers we are artists we are you know gardeners we are jugglers and i i think we have to bring all of those to the question of how do we become and stay human in space. So um, we are down to just now two minutes. So um, any last remaining thoughts, Adam, how do people get a hold of you? How do people follow what you're doing? What's next on the horizon for you? And then I'll have Ubi close us up for the day. Yeah, um, you can find me at thespacejuggler.com. Um, I also have a personal website, uh, adamdipert.com, and you can kind of see a little bit more about my science, um, you know, like hard science research there. Um, and yeah, I would say that there are ways in which um, the imagination and the motivation to explore uh, what it means to be human in, in space uh, is rich with opportunity and rich with insights for people on earth. And so it may seem distant, but um, any level of engaging with it has the potential for um, raising the question that you both keep mentioning, which is what does it mean to be human? And um, it would be lovely for us to thoroughly address uh, in our hearts this question uh, mm -hmm. and find our unity through it uh, before we have some global disaster that forces us to find our unity in response to something else. Um, I think that it is in us um, to, to know it and to feel it um, before mm -hmm. we have to be in a state of response um, to an external stimulus. Amazing. We will leave it at that. Thank you all so much uh, for, for tuning in again. Thank you, Adam. Uh, you know, these, I, th I think, you know, kind of the focus uh, of season two really is going to be like, I think, defining what it means to be human. And I think that's a big, I think that's a big thing we need to address to, to Adam's point of if, if we're going to do this thing together, if we're going to do anything together, it's, it's, we got to really look at that and, and we can use space to help flesh that out even more than we ever thought possible so look forward to that again thank you adam thank you jason thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll check you next time take care